Joining me now is Congressman James Comer of Kentucky. He's currently the ranking member on House Oversight, and he's hoping to become the next uh, chair of the Oversight Committee in the next Congress. Congressman Comer has represented Kentucky's first district, home to Paducah, for those of you wondering, since 2016. And this is his first time joining the program. Congressman Comer, welcome to Meet the Press, sir. Good morning, Chuck. Uh, look, I wanted to talk to you about what your uh, agenda is going to be in a couple months, but I want to ask you uh, on guns. I know what your personal position is um, here. Is there any uh, gun law that you'd like to see stricter when it comes to the purchases of weapons? I mean, we already have many gun laws on the books. If passing a bill would simply end gun violence, then I think uh, you would have overwhelming support in Congress for that. Uh, that's like saying uh, Congress could pass a bill to reduce inflation. Uh, that didn't reduce inflation. So, you know, passing bills doesn't solve the problems we have, as Governor Youngkin said, uh, a mental health crisis in America. And I think there's overwhelming bipartisan support mm -hmm. to fund uh, better mental health uh, programs and try to increase communication between uh, law enforcement agencies and, and social services groups to try to better identify these troubled people before they commit crimes. How would you suggest we go about preventing mentally uh, unstable folks from purchasing guns if we don't have a waiting period or don't have um, certain classifications for, for certain weapons. Is there a way to do this? Well, there, that's something that Congress is, I'm sure, going to discuss. Uh, it's been discussed the entire six years I've been in Congress. It, it's very difficult. You know, the, the number one priority with respect to crime in America for Republicans is going to be the fentanyl crisis. We, we talk about uh, terrible gun crimes in America, but we've had over 100,000 deaths uh, because of fentanyl pouring across our border, which is unsecured right now, that's going to be the top priority for Republicans uh, come January. I understand that. But these massacres, nobody wants to, to see them. I mean, it does feel as if we talk about the individual freedom of somebody to be able to uh, uh, bear, have the right to bear arms. People want to have the individual freedom to shop at Walmart without fear of getting shot. So I guess, is, is there... Is there any place, any room, I know where your position is, any room to allow, a, if we had, we had a waiting period with the Walmart shooter, it's possible three days, might he might have calmed down, or we might have found something troubling in his past and he doesn't get the weapon. Well, Chuck, you talk about this a lot on, on, uh, on Meet the Press, but when you look at cities that have uh, the most strict gun laws, like mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., Chicago, uh, these are the cities with the highest rate of crimes committed with guns. So, mm -hmm. you know, just simply passing more bills isn't going to solve the problem. I think we need to get uh, serious about law enforcement. We need to invest mm -hmm. in more law enforcement. And again, we need to invest in, in mental health and try to improve communication between our uh, social agencies as well as right. their law enforcement. I've heard this talking point about gun laws in cities, but I don't know if you realize this, the, the states that have the most gun laws have the least amount of per capita gun crime, and the states with the least amount of gun laws seem to have the most. I'm showing it here on screen. I don't know if you can see it here. So there is a correlation. If you have more gun laws on the books as a state, you have fewer gun-related crimes, uh, gun-related deaths. That has been proven statistically. Well, in, in places like rural America, where just about every other household uh, exercises their Second Amendment rights, there aren't a lot of crimes in these areas. And I think one reason is because uh, potential criminals know uh, that uh, these people are exercising their Second Amendment rights. So this is something that's uh, indoctrinated in our, in our Constitution. This is yeah. something that uh, Republicans hold uh, you know, close. Uh, and we're, we're going to continue to protect our Second Amendment rights. But while at the same time, we want to get serious about crime in America, the fentanyl crisis, as well as uh, the looting that's taking place in cities, uh, we believe that uh, we need more law enforcement and we need to respect uh, the, the law enforcement. We need to have prosecutors that are serious about prosecuting and not mm -hmm. letting people off in the name of criminal justice. So these are issues that are going to be debated early on in a new Republican majority. All right. Let me, speaking of the Republican majority. Uh, if Kevin McCarthy can't get 218 votes to be speaker, who can? And I know you're a supporter of Kevin McCarthy. Um, what do you tell your colleagues that are denying him uh, their support right now? 
Well, I think we've got a lot of time between now and January the 3rd. I'm of the opinion that on January 3rd, we'll come together as a conference and elect Kevin McCarthy to be Speaker of the House. I, I think this is something that uh, is ongoing. Uh, there are certainly five to eight members that uh, have said they're leaning towards voting no against Kevin McCarthy. Uh, they're, you know, they have a right to mm -hmm. support whoever they want. They have their opinions. They have their goals in the conference. Many of them are on my committee. Uh, <laughs> I'm friends with them, but uh, I'm hopeful at the end of the day that we will come together as a conference and, and elect Kevin. You know, we had an election. Uh, between Kevin McCarthy and my yes. friend Andy Biggs, and, and Kevin McCarthy uh, won by nearly 200 votes. So it's over. There's overwhelming support for Kevin McCarthy in our conference. I, I was just going to say, what do you tell those folks? I mean, what is what is the most credible critique of Kevin McCarthy that you think is fair um, from them that they're making? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly there's been uh, instances in the past that uh, certain Republicans' voices weren't heard in, in the conference. But at the end of the day, we need to give Kevin a chance. You know, I think a lot of these members are frustrated because of things that Paul Ryan did or things that John Boehner did. Kevin McCarthy's never had a chance to be speaker. We had an election. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a lot of debate in the conference. And in the end, Kevin McCarthy was the overwhelming winner. And, and I'm hopeful that our conference will come together, and I believe we will, on January 3rd and, and make Kevin McCarthy the next Republican Speaker of the House. Assuming you're chairman of the Oversight Committee, if you've got one investigation you get to focus on, if there's just one, I know you've got a bunch you want to do, what's the one? Well, we're going to investigate between 40 and 50 different things. We have the capacity. Uh, we'll have 25 members on the committee, and we're going to have a staff close to 70. So uh, we have the ability to investigate a lot of things. And, and let's just face it, Chuck, over the past two years, the Democrats on the House Oversight Committee haven't investigated anything in this administration. They've investigated the Washington Commanders football team. Uh, we've had several hearings on social issues mm -hmm. that the Oversight Committee has absolutely nothing to do with, issues like abortion. Uh, we believe that uh, there have been hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars wasted over the past three years. So that spans two administrations in the name of COVID. We want to have hearings on that. We want to try mm -hmm. to determine uh, what happened with the fraudulent unemployment insurance funds, the fraudulent PPP loan funds, uh, some of this money that's being spent for state and local governments in, in the COVID stimulus uh, monies. So right. these are things that are going to be priorities for us as a committee. Waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement. That's going to be the goal of the House Oversight Committee. All right, before I let you go, uh, as a member of the Republican Party, Donald Trump, in many cases, is seen as the leader of the party. He was dining with uh, an, a known white supremacist and certainly somebody who traffics in anti-Semitic rhetoric, referring to, to Yi, formerly known as Kanye West, and this Nick Fuentes person. I'm just curious, uh, do you think it was a mistake for the former president to do that? Well, he certainly needs better judgment in who he dines with. I know that he's issued a statement and said he didn't know uh, who those people were. But at any rate, you know, my focus is going to be on uh, investigating the current administration uh, as the next chairman of the House Oversight Committee and trying to get a handle on the massive amounts of waste, fraud, right. and abuse in our federal government. And I think that's where the American people want us to be, and that's where Republicans in the uh, majority are going to be focused. I, I understand thinking he should have better judgment. I assume you condemn this? Like, you, wouldn't, you would not take a meeting with this person? It, I would not take a meeting with, with that person, no. I wouldn't take a meeting with Kanye West either, but that's, uh, that's my opinion. Uh, James Comer, uh, Republican from Kentucky, the next chair of the House Oversight Committee. And I imagine we'll have a lot more to talk about uh, on those investigations as the time uh, moves on. Thank you for coming on and sharing your perspective, sir. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.